You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Wounded Warrior Project provides these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So now it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Join us at findwwp.org. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. 
you'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now, 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. The world around us is an amazing place filled with beauty and with science. But let's face it. Sometimes the science can be so confusing that it takes a Ph.D. to understand it. Well, you're in luck. I just happen to have a Ph.D. Come and take a seat. Perhaps I can explain the world around us in a way we all can understand. Welcome to Conversations in Science. I'm Dr. Judy L. Moore. Call me Doc. Guys, and welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of Conversations in Science. I am Dr. Judy L. Moore, and as my intro does say, I do actually have a PhD. No, I'm not a medical doctor. Sorry, guys. I'm a doctor of science, more specifically, a doctor of astronomy. But hey, I also have a background in engineering, and yeah, I'm just a science geek. For those of you who are new to the show, the way it works is I do the best I can to explain science in a way everybody can understand, but I have somebody there for my checks and balances. Jess, where are you? What's up, Doc? Hey, Jess. Jesse Sanders, my producer, is constantly coming up and going, no, 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 Doc. You need to explain this because I don't understand. And I have a horrible feeling that today she's going to be doing that a lot because this is an area that she doesn't quite know. So what is it we are talking about today, Jess? Jess, set the stage. All right. I have my own show, Jesse's POV. It's international affairs stuff mostly. I was doing show prep. And into my wonderful search engine, I typed the word turkey. (laughs) No, not that kind of turkey. I was looking for the country. But I came up with prehistoric turkeys. And I (laughs) threw the article at Doc and went on about my show prep. And it wasn't just any prehistoric turkey that we were looking at. This is a prehistoric turkey found in Australia. Cool. And I was just... I'm going to have so much fun with this because my brain just went and took an instant leap. Dinosaurs. How do we know how old those dinosaur bones or fossils or anything else we find? How do we know how old it really, really is? So of course I had to come up with this idea to talk about today about carbon dating, uranium dating, and all of the other forms of dating of artifacts that are found around the world. I'm glad you clarified that with artifacts, because I didn't think want to make people think we were doing a thing on dating as in people. No, 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 no. We're talking about how do we know how old something really is. And I'm not talking about human beings, because we know when they're born. Or at least I hope we know when we're born. 
Okay. I don't know. We're talking about, you know, just various different items that we find through various different archaeological digs. How do we know how old those artifacts are? Okay. We're going to have to take a step back, right back, before we get into all of this concept of carbon dating or uranium dating or anything like that, because we are going to be looking at how isotopes work. But before we can now go through and talk about that, I have to actually tell you what an isotope is. Fans of the show that have been around since the beginning will remember that in our very first episode that we ever did, we talked about isotopes and nucleus of an atom and various different things. So for those who haven't heard that episode, we're going to go back and we're going to talk about all of that again. Basic, basic nucleus. Here we go. I like it when you start from the beginning, Doc. It makes me feel less left behind. That is the whole point. We've got to do this. We've got to make sure that everybody is on the same playing field that we are all on. So, basic nucleus. So, we're talking about atoms of various different types. They are all made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. The nucleus itself, so that's the center of the atom, is just your protons and your neutrons. That's it. The electrons are just these fast moving whizzing around things and they are what attract and make everything else stick together. They're sort of like the glue for the various different elements to stick together within the atom. But the problem is, is that the nucleus itself is only made up of protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons don't have a charge at all. But for those who remember things like when we were talking about magnets and all these other bits and pieces, like charges, repel. They do not want to go near each other. So if you're trying to push two things that are positively charged together, it's going to go, no, dude, I'm not going here. I want to go that way. So what's happening is that the, nu- the neutrons are acting like the glue in the nucleus. They're trying to say, no, proton, come back here. Stay there. You have to stay there. But they give like a little space. So that way the protons are not going, no, I can't cope with this. This guy over there, that proton's too close to me. So they're giving a little bit of space. But there does come to be a point where the nucleus has gotten so big, so it has too many protons in it, that it just goes, (laughs) no, I ain't staying together. I don't care what you do and what you say. I'm just going to break apart. And that are, those are become what we call the radioactive situations, the radioactive um, elements. Okay. Wait a minute. So are these old bones radioactive? Okay. Bones are to a certain extent, but we're going to come before we get into that. We're going to talk about very quickly the isotopes. Now, the easiest isotope description I can go through and talk about is hydrogen. For those who are listening, were listening to that very first episode we were talking about, we were talking about things like heavy water and bits and pieces. But to explain heavy water, I had to explain what a deuterium was. Hydrogen has got multiple different forms of isotope. And the definition of a isotope is that it has the exact same number of protons in the nucleus a different number of neutrons. For the hydrogen atom, it has one proton. That's hydrogen one. Deuterium has one proton, so it's still a hydrogen, but it has two neutrons. It has the, the neutron, so it has a double weight, one proton, one neutron. Tritium, so it's three times the weight of a normal hydrogen, but it's still a hydrogen because it only has one proton. It has two neutrons. That one's radioactive. It's a bit unstable because it has too many things in its nucleus and it just doesn't like it. When we're talking about things like carbon dating, we're talking about what we call carbon-14. Carbon-12 is what most of the life, hang on, carbon-12 is what most of life is made of. And what's happened with carbon-12 is it has six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. Okay. Now, remember I said the neutrons were like the the glue that were keeping the protons together, but they were also more spaces. They were sort of holding those protons apart, but at the same time, keeping them into the nucleus. Now, if you want to add more neutrons to that, 
Okay. Eventually, it's going to get to the point where you've got too much of a gap between these protons, and it's going to go, <laughs> I'm free! You can't hold on to me anymore. So there's a and limit to how much stuff each one of them can gather. Exactly. And in the case of carbon, that's a carbon-14, which a carbon-14 has got six protons and eight neutrons. Carbon-14 is radioactive. It doesn't like staying together. It wants to go apart. It doesn't like it. So it's kind of held together by the fact it is, but it's not a happy ca camper. It's not a happy camper. It, it's a reasonably stable camper because now here comes the next term. Huh? Half-life. Before, Okay, so half carbon-14 has got a half-life of 5,730 years. What the half-life means is if I was to take a sample of, say, 100 atoms of carbon-14, okay? So if I've got about 100 carbon-14 atoms in 5,730 years, if I was to measure that same sample, I would only have 50 of them because half of my sample has broken down and turned into something else. All right, Doc. How can they measure half-life when we haven't been, there's no one who's actually witnessed this particular half-life of over 5,000 years? Yeah, that is a very good question. It comes down to data interpolation. Basically, what we do is we take a series of samples and we have got a known number of elements in it and we measure it. And then we go through and we say, well, in how many days? or however so many days, we take another sample and we measure it and we record it. And then we do it again, say so many days later. And we keep recording this and we keep recording this change. And you may only get one that's changed or you may get two that's changed or three. And you keep recording how, how all of this stuff has changed. And with that data point, you can work out, well, if I've got on day X this many elements or this many atoms sitting here, but I've got on day Y this many atoms and on day Z this many atoms, then I can come up with a curve that will fit that and hence I can work out what is the half-life, how much of it would give me half of the sample that I had. So it's lots of math, it basically, Doc. It is lots of math, lots of data. And the more stable something is, the longer that half-life is, the more, um, the, the more unstable it is, that half-life whizzes by. It's pretty quick. And so there is some instances with some radioactive substances that people actually have been around to witness half of it gone. Because in some cases, the half-life of a certain radioactive element may be in the matter of seconds. Really? Which one? Yes, really. If I think off the top of my head, I think there's actually one of the hydrogen isotopes falls into that category. But I think it's a hydrogen four or five. It's not the trit tritium one. So there are some that are have got very short half-lives. Now, in terms of things like carbon-14, it's a very, it's a reasonably long half-life, but dare we say it, uranium has got a half-life of, well, it depends on which one we're talking about. If you're talking about uranium-235, then it's got a half-life of 710 million years. Whoa, 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 uranium-235, isn't that the one that we find in nature that gets put in the power plants? Uh-huh. And it's variant, it's very close cousin, uranium-238, has got the half-life of 4.74 billion years. Yeah, those babies are so around for a very long time. Those are some pretty big numbers, Doc. I wouldn't have wanted to have been the math person on those I don't do well with numbers. And I wouldn't have wanted to been the person that went through and measured it either because uranium is very radioactive. It's, it's 
Yeah, it's not nice stuff. As I see it right sort of early that if you've got too many protons and too many neutrons in that nucleus, it just wants to break apart. It doesn't want to stay together. There is no stable form of uranium. All isotopes of uranium are radioactive. They're not stable. They all want to break down. But that's not necessarily the case on some of the other ones, like lead. Lead actually does have stable isotopes. In fact, lead has actually got quite a few stable different isotopes. And lead's a big, big atom. It's quite big. Okay, so we were sort of thinking, So do, before I carry on, does that make sense? Isotopes, do we understand an isotope, Jess? I think I'm with you, Doc. Okay, so carbon dating. Let's take this look at carbon dating. And that's probably the one that I think a lot of people have heard about at least at least once, because if you're watching various different, I don't know, various different shows about ancient Egypt or anything like that, they'll suddenly talk about, oh, we need to carbon date this artifact that we found in the tomb and all of these sorts of things. I, I find that funny to start with because carbon dating only works on organic material. It doesn't work on inorganic material. So it makes me a bit laugh. Doc, would organic material also include plant material? Exactly. Anything that's plant or animal would be considered organic. And in some cases, you can actually use, um, like, the clothing fabrics. A lot of fabric, especially older fabric, was actually based on organic material. It's more in the modern era that our clothing is synthetic. So you can actually carbon date things from clothing and strips of cloth, too, which is always really fun. I was just about to ask about cotton sheets, so I guess that would be organic then. Yeah, cotton sheets would be classified organic. Silk is organic. Um, Linen, to a certain extent, is organic as well. (sighs) So basically... What What's happened and what the theory is, is that the amount of carbon-14 that's in an organic structure will be indicative of how old it was when it stopped breathing. Now, okay. plants do breathe. I hope everybody understands that. Yeah, they take they, in stuff we don't like called carbon dioxide and they give us oxygen. <laughs> Yeah, so they actually are breathing in the the atmosphere around them and expelling out. And we do the same. We're breathing in that atmosphere and we're expelling out the things that our body doesn't need. But a large portion of our atmosphere is actually nitrogen. And last time I checked, we don't use nitrogen in our bodies. And I don't think plants use nitrogen in their bodies either. But we are still breathing in that nitrogen. And nitrogen in the atmosphere will actually occasionally be converted into carbon-14. So there is a small trace amount of carbon-14 in our atmosphere. It's a very small amount. It's not very much at all. I mean, you're talking, if we say, let's say there's 10 to the 12 atoms of carbon 12 10 to the 12 every 10 what? to the 12 what's 10 to so, the 12 so you know so that's a one with 12 zeros behind it that's i couldn't even hang on thousand million billion trillion i think yeah i think that's right hang on one thousand million billion yeah trillion one trillion carbon atoms So carbon-12, for every one trillion, there will be one and a half carbon-14. Okay. Slight disportionment, isn't there? There's mostly carbon-12. It's almost all carbon-12. But there's like a small, tiny proportionment of carbon-14. And there's even a small proportionment of carbon-13. But carbon-13 is stable like carbon-12 is. So we're not going to worry about carbon-13. Okay, so coming back, carbon-14. We are breathing in 
a small trace amount of carbon-14, very small amounts. And so our bodies will have approximately the same amount of carbon-14 in our bodies compared to what is in the atmosphere. It's almost the same. And in the past, it was believed there was more carbon-14 in the atmosphere than what we have today. So by measuring how much carbon-14 there is in a sample versus how much carbon-12 there is in the sample, you should be able to work out when that sample died, when this exchange and breathing in more carbon-14 stopped, when we weren't getting any more carbon-14. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I'm with you so far, but that's a lot of zeros, Doc. It is a lot of zeros. It's a lot of math. I'm so sorry, guys. It is a lot of math. (sighs) But that's the way it works. I'm glad you have to deal with these numbers, not me. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Downside. Carbon dating only goes 50,000 years to any accuracy. So So carbon dating can't date everything. No. No. Anything that's older than 50,000 years cannot use carbon dating on. Puts a bit of a spanner on our works, doesn't it? Yeah. Then how how did we start this show? uh, Prehistoric turkeys, I think. Yeah. Are they going to be 50,000 years old? I don't think so, Doc. I think they're a little bit older. Uh, Just a tad. Like a million years older? (laughs) <laughs> like a million years older. Yeah, like so ma- like billions of years older in some cases. Okay, so carbon dating is not going to work for dinosaurs, but they need to have the concepts and the philosophies behind how carbon dating works because one of the techniques that they use for things like geological samples, which dinosaurs sort of fall into the realm of geological samples, and I'll talk I'll tell you about that in a moment. One of the techniques they use for geological samples is what we know as uranium dating. Okay, so now we've moved from carbon to uranium. Now we are dealing with nasty stuff. (laughs) We are dealing with nasty stuff. But here's the thing. All soil on Earth has got a small trace amount of uranium in it. But the amount of uranium that's in our normal everyday garden is so tiny, it's so minuscule that you are now talking background radiation. If you were to pull out a Geiger counter, and a Geiger counter is a device that will measure the amount of radiation that's around you, your Geiger counter is going to constantly be ticking. It's going to constantly be picking up radiation. You're going to point it at things like your computer, and it's going to go, oh, we have a bit more. You're going to point it at your cell phone or your television, and it's going to go, oh, we have a bit more. You're going to point it at, say, your garden, your rose patches or your roses, and it's still going to pick up some, but nowhere near as much as it picks up if if you're pointing it at your computer. Well, is that why some people will tell you that computer screens are bad for you? Mm, It is one of the reasons why computer screens are bad for you. But basically, there is a level of radiation that is in our atmosphere, that's in our environment, that we as humans are designed. We have the physical capability of just brushing it off and ignoring it. Part of that is because we are surrounded by radioactive sources on a regular basis. Our soil has got tiny, 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 tiny traces of uranium in it. And goodness knows, I'm usually in front of a screen, Doc. (laughs) So am I. I'm in front of two of them. (laughs) But there are parts of the world that have actually got more concentrations of uranium than others, but that's where the uranium mines are. That's where they dig up the uranium deliberately. They're actually trying to actually extract the uranium from the soil. It's naturally there. It has always been naturally there. But we can use this to our advantage because it is naturally there. So we can actually go through 
and look at a piece of rock and we can say, well, it has a certain amount of uranium in it and we can compare it to say lead. There's trace elements of lead in almost all soil as well. So we can work out how much lead, how much uranium, and believe it or not, uranium, when it goes through its numerous levels of transformation, because it's got quite a few different paths it goes through, but it eventually turns to lead, eventually becomes lead. So we can calculate how much uranium would have been there to start with based on how much uranium we have today and how much lead there is today. And then from that, we can work out how old a sample would have been because we know the half-life from that wonderful, fantastic calculation that someone would have done at some point in history, measuring a sample painstakingly and probably getting sick by the end of it because they were probably exposed to too much radiation, but we won't go there. They worked out what the half-life is. So we know what the half-life is of uranium. We can work all this out and we can get an estimate of how old that sample is. Now, uranium dating, when we're doing things like that, it gets you into the ballpark of millions of years. We can't isolate into the idea of thousands of years. Then how do we know That's, how old that dinosaur really is if we can only get into the millions? But here's the thing. Dinosaur eras are on the tens of thousands of years scale, aren't they? So we can measure down to that tens of thousands of years, but we can't measure into that thousand year mark. We have to use different techniques to get to that thousand year mark. And that's where the carbon dating comes in, because we're, if, we're to, if we're looking at anything that's older than, say, 50,000 years, we're not going to care if we're talking 51,000 years or if we're talking, you know, 51,500 years. We don't care. We just care that we're looking at, say, it's older than 50,000 years, but we will care if we're looking at something that's, say, 70,000 years. And okay. uranium dating can get to that level. It just can't get any closer, if that makes any sense. So it can put us within a few thousand years. Exactly. So it can, as a consequence, what it can do is it can tell us what era we're looking at. Well, where are of we? Eras. Do you know where we are now? No. I'm innocent in that respect. I can't remember. <laughs> Commercial break Let time, Doc. What was that? Time to take that com ever wonderful commercial break, Doc. Oh, is that the era that we're on? Oh, okay. Money bills. Yes, okay. I got the hint. <laughs> Pay those bills, Jess. You got it, Doc. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Wounded Warrior Project provides these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So now it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Join us at findwwp.org. I wasn't prepared to be a caregiver to mom. I had no idea how hard it would be and what I would need to know. Things I never thought of, like how to improve her mood and ways for me to stay positive. Luckily, I found the Caregiving Resource Center from AARP. It had articles about the basics, but also information about the hurdles I was facing. Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Articles, tips, and tools to help you both care for your loved one and care for yourself. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. 
Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. Every day, the men and women of the United States Marine Corps stand ready to defend the American way of life. The few, the proud, the Marines. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Sometimes writers feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. 
For a full list of services, visit BlackWolfEditorial.com. Hey, Doc, we're back. <gasps> we're back. <gasps> we're back. Okay. Okay. I'm awake. And I'll, yeah, water's down. Water's aside. Okay. Right. So we were talking about H2O. That's we water. Can- That's one I know. What was that? I said H2O. That's water. That's actually <laughs> one formula I know. <laughs> Okay, we were talking. We were talking water. Uh, okay, right. So we were talking about um, we were talking about dinosaurs and how they get dated, and but not specifically just necessarily dinosaurs. We were also talking about things like carbon dating and uranium dating. And yeah, sorry guys, if it sounds a bit boring, and it probably was a little bit. We'll try. Not to make it a bit more boring, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things and dinosaurs. Here we go. Okay. Carbon dating, just as a quick recap, is basically when you're measuring how much radioactive form of carbon you have, which is your carbon-14, comparing it to how much carbon-12 you have, which is your standard stock, steel, stable carbon, and you're comparing how much there's there, and you can extrapolate because we know that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,710 years, something like that. Yeah, 5,730 years. We know that half-life, half-life being how much of the sample is half the size, we can work this out. So the question we've got is, can't use this for dinosaur bones because dinosaur bones are older than 50,000 years. What do we do? Well, we could use uranium dating or any other. If you hear that, like, there's also another one called argon dating. So they're using argon instead. All of these forms of dating, of using atoms, are actually using the radioactive isotopes. They're measuring the radioactive isotopes in a sample. They know what it turns into. They're comparing elements to elements, and they're working it out. That's Doc- how all of those techniques work. Quick question. Argon is a gas, isn't it? It is. It is indeed a gas. But it can be compressed and, com- and combined into other elements as well. Remember, we're looking at the atoms involved. We're not looking at just necessarily its pure raw form. When you combine things like, hey, you know, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas. But when you combine it with oxygen, it becomes a liquid. It becomes water. It becomes water. Exactly. And, of course, if you combine it with, say, something else, it actually becomes a solid as well. So depending on what's actually how it's combined and what, what it's in, the material in, it can be in its solid form. So we're looking at the atoms, not the various different little element. The um, we're looking at the atoms themselves, not the various different compounds that it happens to be in. Compositional structure is always interesting, anyway, because that helps us. Speaking of compositional structure, that's one of the things that when they're looking at an artifacts from various different sites, when they're trying to f- make sure that they were all in a site at the same time, that they're from the same era, and not somebody just coming across a dig site and then contaminating it in some way, one of the things they do is they will look at chemical analysis on the various different dirt around all at the time, same areas. So they can so, tell if you track dirt in from your garden versus the dirt that was actually there. Exactly. That's exactly it. And basically... Because I know historically there have been cases where somebody's gone through and said, hey, look at this dinosaur I found. But it was turned out it was to be some fake dinosaur that they made up because they were just trying to be real. And this is one of the concerns that is there because you'll have these people that are just coming up with this because they put this so much money into these digs, into these archaeological digs. And they just aren't coming up with the results. The funders want something, and so they'll fake it. And so there are ways that you actually test to make sure that you haven't got a fake sample. And one of them is doing these dating processes 
as well as doing the chemical composition of checking around with other soils and bits and pieces that are around it. Okay, that makes sense, Doc, because you got to make sure it's real science. You got to make sure what you're looking at is real. It's so embarrassing when it's not real. Now, if it's not real, okay, that can still be, it's still science, but you still want to validate. You don't want to actually say, hey, look, we found a dinosaur. We found the missing link of the human evolution. We found it. But hang on, it's fake. <laughs> no, we, we don't want that. Can we avoid that? That'd be good. Sounds like Please? womp womp fail. <laughs> yeah, womp womp fail. Okay, so one of the other ways that they'll go through and date, say, dinosaurs in particular, or dinosaur fossils, is they'll actually look at the actual stratification layers that are in rock. Have you ever been driving down a road? And it's uh, like an exposed layer of soil. There, there's an exposed rock face. And it's in layers. I've seen that. Have you ever noticed that? I drift, drove through a mountain range. Yeah. As you're driving through, you'll see these layers. And basically what it is, is dust will form layers. Oh, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out how, you know, I dust a surface on my my desk or on my television and it just like the next day I get a layer of dust just forming. Imagine what that's like over years of no one coming through and actually shifting that dirt around. They're just letting it settle. I've seen that. Yeah. And when something changes in the atmosphere, Uh, Like, say, for example, you have a sudden um, uh, volcanic eruption or you might have earthquake that might have upset and dug up things and changed the way the the local dirt and the local dust is the, the local composition. What will happen is that layer of dirt will change. And that's why you get what looks like layers on mountain rock and ranges because there'll be these events that have happened that have created this layer and changed how it's structured. And that's why you'll get some areas that might be dark, darker because there might be a volcanic eruption or something that will create that layer of thicker dirt or something. So in a way, the and layers are like tree rings. They are. And they're a history. They are a history of what's actually happened in the atmosphere and what's happened in the local region. And those thicknesses of those bands will tell you how long something was and some sort of event had affected that region. Now, there's quite a bit of information. I mean, that is a whole area of science on its own, that geology kind concept it's it's a complete different area of of science that just blows me away all right so but when what, we get in the rock hand, hound on convo science doc we do need a rock hound on convo science but basically what they're doing what one of the things that they can do when they're looking at paleontology so they're looking at the dinosaur bones is they can look at the layers in the dirt and they can say we found the dinosaur or the bones the fossils at this layer in the dirt, but what was happening above it and what was happening below it. And they can actually date the bones by looking at the layers above and below and dating the layers above and below as a consequence. Anything below it would have been happened in the past prior to so the bones or above prior is to that newer, dinosaur below dying. is older. Yeah, it's older. And anything above it, obviously, was a more recent. So you can't, by using that methodology, you're not going to have the dinosaur died X year. You're not going to have that information. What you're going to have is you're going to have the dinosaur died between this year and this year. So it's this range of information. And by looking at, say, how far down it is compared to those layers, you might be able to get a bit more closer of a ballpark figure, but it is still an approximation. That's one method of doing it. The other methods that they look at are the dating using the uranium datings. 
But they will also say, look at other effects that would have happened. They will look at um, events that they knew happen at one point in history that from a different site, and they will look at, well, we're seeing this happening in the soil over here, which corresponds to this event over here. Oh, we're now seeing over here this event, the same composition, composition, the same structure in the soil. Right. So this happened at this date and hence get an approximation of how old those bones are as a consequence. Okay, so there's there's a lot of work into dating these bones, Doc. It is. It is a lot of work that goes into them. And that's why when somebody goes through and they say they found a bones, they found something, you might see photographs of them pulling the bones out of the ground or uncovering the bones, but then you won't hear anything about the process and, and how old those bones are or anything like that for years later. And they might eventually, years later, say something about it. And it is because of the fact that this process of dating the bones and this process of working out exactly what it is you're dealing with, whether it's real or not, all these other aspects, it's not something that you can do within 24 hours. It takes a lot longer than that. So... Geologists and archaeologists are pretty patient people. They have to be. They have to be. Well, Doc, that rules and... me out. <laughs> it rules me out, too. Um, yeah, I'm not as patient as somebody seems to might think that, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> okay, for a moment, I just want to talk about things like petrified wood and how this works, because I know that there is a myth out there that things like dinosaur bones and stuff like that turns into oil. Yeah, no. I think every one of us has seen that one as a kid at some point. Either they turn into oil or they turn into some other element. Well, I know how the myth got started. Oh, do tell. Basically, what it is is that bones and organic material, when it dies, so you're now talking about it's gone into the dirt, it's gone into the soil, it's now been covered up by a layer of dust and more dust and more dust and thickened dust and getting more and more. After a while, what happens is the amount of dirt on top of it gets so much that you have a significant pressure. And when things are under a lot of pressure, whatever chemical composition exchange that happens, happens quicker. Bones will actually leak. They will leach out whatever minerals are in their structure into the surrounding soil. It is a known process. There is this exchange and they will actually absorb into them whatever was in the soil as well. So there's this this process that goes through and exchanges out one element for another and it just keeps swapping over and that's where this idea of oh it's going to become oil has come about because you have this exchange process which is natural it happens under high pressure and the next thing we know here comes the myth about turning into oil so no sorry guys no, our very we're not going to be able to miraculously buster. find more oil. Our very own Mythbuster. <laughs> so things like petrified wood, because I've actually got a small piece of petrified wood, and I love it because it's this nice, you know, you can definitely see the wooden structure and the, the, the layers that were there for the wood. You can definitely see it. It definitely looks like wood, but it's a piece of stone. And that's what actually happens to these bones and any of the organic material is that they turn into stone. They don't turn into oil. They have this process. You get this calcification and this um, exchange going on of other minerals. and, And it just becomes this compressed 
harden stone. And that's why dinosaur bones actually last for such a long time as well, because they have become stone as they're being surrounded by this dirt. It's okay, also Doc. why getting them out is such a hard process because they are stone buried in stone and you have to very carefully chip it away or you will chip away the stone itself, the bone. Which so is now it's stone. A slow, patient, time pa- taking process. And there is no now, now, now with it. There definitely is no now, now, now. Laser cutting technology has improved what we can do. Um, so has things like some of the x ray technologies that you can use um, doing the MRIs and, and doing some of the other type of CT scanning. They have all improved the process because what they can do now is they can go through and take, they can extract the, the sample in large chunks and they do do it in large chunks and they take it back to say a dark room or a, a dark area, uh, sort of like a big warehouse. And then they can x-ray it or use whatever other, technology they want to use and they can say well the bone structure is here and then they can use like a laser to actually cut closer to that bone than what they would have if they were using things like pickaxes and they can do it nicely and very fine and get most of it out and then it's just your normal tip tap tap chip 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 brush it away with a nice little stone little piece of uh, a nice little fine brush and painstaking manual process at that point. I think but I modern saw a technology picture. is improving it. I think I saw a photograph of an archaeologist using a toothbrush and a spoon. Yep. Yep. I I think that it, I've seen similar. I've seen, um, I think I have saw one where they were using the old style shaving um, brushes that you can get. I think I saw one using those. I think they probably only had a shaving kit. (laughs) That's probably all he had. (laughs) Oh, he made use of what he had. That's a good thing, Doc. Yes, using resources wisely. I'm a fan of using resources wisely. Well, speaking of resources and using them wisely, you've got about five minutes to wrap it up. Oh, five minutes. So, Jess, is there anything about this topic that you are just blown away with and you feel that we just need to quickly go over again. It's a lot of science packed into an episode, but I don't, I think you actually got there in the end, despite my quirkiness here. (laughs) We are going to reach out, I think to a paleontologist. And I think we need to also reach out to an, to a geologist as well. Just to get a little bit more insight into these dating of things, as well as with the geologist working out, understanding those layers and the dirt and other bits and pieces and how they work as well. I think we need to do that. So if anybody out there listening is a paleontologist or a geologist, or for that matter, any scientist, if you are interested in coming on the show, we so want to hear from you. Definitely. And how- all you have to do is send us an email at science at KLRN radio, and we will gladly, gladly talk to you about science. Yep. Science at problem. KLRN radio.com. <laughs> okay, Jess, I think I've hit the end of my understanding with this as well. Unless there is any questions you have for me. I have questions, but I'm not sure you're the right expert to, to ask them. So, yeah, we got to find some more. We got to bring more people into this sci- world of science over here. Definitely, definitely. Okay, Jess, I think that's it. I agree, Doc. See you next time. See you later, guys. Well, that brings us to an end of the Nether Conversations in Science. If you have any questions about science and about some of the world around us, feel free to drop me a line. I'm on Twitter. And you can find me at Judy L. Moore, or you can look me up on Facebook, Judy L. Moore, or you can drop me a line on my personal website, JudyLmore.com. I think you're seeing the pattern here. 
Then, of course, if you are interested in some of the other projects I do, which is the writing and editing, feel free to check me out on blackwolfeditorial.com. But then, of course, don't forget, if you are wanting more information about the science, you can also contact us at the station with the email of science at klrnradio.com. Then, of course, there's my cohort that keeps going through and popping up. Well, for anyone who wants to track me down, you can find me on Twitter at Radio Host Jesse, and you can email me at the station at jesse at klrnradio.com. Bye, guys. Bye.